Section 10 of The Maker of Rainbows. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Maker of Rainbows by Richard Le Gallienne. The Buyer of Sorrows. On an evening of singular sunset, about the rich beginning of May, the little market town of Beethorpe was startled by the sound of a trumpet. Beethorpe was an ancient town, mysteriously sown centuries ago, like a wandering thistledown of human life, amid the silence and the nibbling sheep of the great chalk downs. It stood in a hollow of the long, smooth billows of pale pasture that suavely melted into the sky on every side. The evening was so still that the little river running across the threshold of the town and encircling what remained of its old walls was the noisiest thing to be heard, dominating with its talkative murmur the bedtime hum of the high street. Suddenly, as the flamboyance of the sky was on the edge of fading, and the world beginning to wear a forlorn, forgotten look, a trumpet sounded from the western heights above the town, as though the sunset itself had spoken. And the people in Beethorpe, looking up, saw three horsemen against the lurid sky. Three times the trumpet blew, and the simple folk of Beethorpe, tumbling out into the street at the summons and looking to the west with sleepy bewilderment, asked themselves, was it the last trumpet? Or was it the long-threatened invasion of the King of France? Again the trumpet blew, and then the braver of the young men of the town hastened up the hill to learn its meaning. As they approached the horsemen, they perceived that the center of the three was a young man of great nobility of bearing, richly but somberly dressed, and with a dark, beautiful face, filled with a proud melancholy. He kept his eyes on the fading sunset, sitting motionless upon his horse, apparently oblivious of the commotion his arrival had caused. The horseman on his right hand was clad after the manner of a herald, and the horseman on his left hand was clad after the manner of a steward. And the three horsemen sat motionless, awaiting the bewildered ambassadors of Beethorpe. When these had approached near enough, the herald once more set the trumpet to his lips and blew, and then, unfolding a parchment scroll, read in a loud voice, To the folk of Beethorpe! Greeting from the high and mighty Lord Mortimer of the Marches. Whereas our heart had gone out toward the sorrows of our people in the counties and towns and villages of our domain, we hereby issue proclamation that whoever hath a sorrow, let him or her bring it forth, and we, out of our private purse, will purchase the said sorrow according to its value, that the hearts of our people be lightened of their burdens. And when the herald had finished reading, he blew again upon the trumpet three times, and the villagers looked at one another in bewilderment, but some ran down the hill to tell their neighbors of the strange proposal of their lord. Thus, presently, nearly all the village of Beethorpe was making its way up the hill to where those three horsemen loomed against the evening sky. Never was such a sorrowful company. Up the hill they came, carrying their sorrows in their hands, sorrows for which, in excited haste, they had rummaged old drawers and forgotten cupboards and even ran hurriedly into the churchyard. Lord Mortimer of the Marches sat his horse with the same austere indifference, his melancholy profile against the fading sky. Only those who stood near to him noted a kindly, ironic flicker of a smile 
in his eyes as he saw, apparently seeing nothing, the poor little raked-up sorrows of his village of Beethorpe. He was a fantastic young lord of many sorrows. His heart had been broken in a very strange way. Death and pity were his closest friends. He was so sad himself that he had come to realize that sorrow is the only sincerity of life. Thus, sorrow had become a kind of passion with him, even a kind of connoisseurship, and he had come, so to say, to be a collector of sorrows. It was partly pity and partly an odd form of dilettantism, for his own sad heart made him pitiful for and companionable with any other sad heart. But the sincerity of his sorrow made him jealous of the sanctity of sorrow, and at the same time sternly critical of, and sadly amused by, the hypocrisies of sorrow. So, as he sat his horse and gazed at the sunset, he smiled sadly to himself as he heard, without seeming to hear, the small, insincere sorrows of his village of Beethorpe. Sorrows forgotten long ago, but suddenly rediscovered in old drawers and unopened cupboards at the sound of his lordship's trumpet and the promise of his strange proclamation. Was there a sorrow in the world that no money could buy? It was to find such a sorrow that Lord Mortimer thus fantastically rode from village to village of his estates with Harold and Steward. The unpurchasable sorrow, the sorrow no gold can gild, no jewel can buy. Far and wide he had ridden over his estates, seeking so rare a sorrow, but as yet he had found no sorrow that could not be bought with a little bag of gold and silver coins. So he sat his horse while the villagers of Beethorpe were paid out of a great leathern bag by the steward, for the steward understood the mind of his master, and, without troubling him, paid each weeping and whimpering peasant as he thought fit. In another great bag the steward had collected the sorrows of the village of Beethorpe, and by this the moon was rising, and, with another blast of trumpet by way of farewell, the three horsemen took the road again to Lord Mortimer's castle. When, out of the great leathern bag, in Lord Mortimer's cabinet, they poured upon the table the sorrows of Beethorpe. The young lord smiled to himself, turning over one sorrow after the other, as though they had been precious stones, for there was not one genuine sorrow among them. But later there came news to him that there was one real sorrow in Beethorpe, and he rode alone on horseback to the village and found a beautiful girl laying flowers on a grave. She was so beautiful that he forgot his ancient grief, and he thought that all his castles would be but a poor exchange for her face. Maiden, said he, let me buy your sorrow with three counties and seven castles. And the girl looked up at him from the grave with eyes of forget-me-not, and said, my lord, you mistake. This is not sorrow. It is my only joy. End of section 10. Recording by Leslie Wildeson, Portland, Oregon. www.arielwarthog.com